My name is Patrick Atkinson and I'm a councillor in the city of Johannesburg and I'm the DA finance spokesperson in the city of Johannesburg. Uh, it's been quite a challenging last year and a half and what has actually happened has really been one of the largest municipal failures since the advent of democracy in South Africa since 1994 and that's the billing crisis in Johannesburg. Johannesburg is the country's largest municipality. It's the hard economic heartbeat of Africa, so in essence it's very important that the city is actually takes in its money correctly so it can spend the money correctly. And a very functional Johannesburg City Council really should be supporting economic development and should be supporting the success of the city. But what we found is that with the billing crisis over the last year and a half, the city has actually been really brought to its knees. Uh, the city's short of money at the moment. One of the major results of the billing crisis is that we're not actually collecting the revenue that we should. Uh, and at this point, we know, according to the most recent reports of the city, that we're about 6% behind where we should be on our collections, which means out of 22 billion rand that we should be collecting over a year, we've got about a 1.3 billion rand back hole. Now, the problem about that is that it means a cutback in service delivery for the residents of Johannesburg. I think it's safe to assume that Johannesburg is in crisis. The reality of the, ma of, of the matter is that the city has a high liquidity crisis and what that simply means is that the city actually doesn't have money to be able to deliver on its mandate. Its cash collection mechanisms have been very poor, so in actual fact the reading of meters right through to the, to the giving of a bill has been something that we've been uh, confronted with, with many residents receiving incorrect bills, with many residents who actually want to pay not being able to get the right information so that they know what to pay. And this, in and of its own self, compounds the issue in that the city cannot collect money and therefore cannot spend it. And this constitutes what we really come to know as the billing crisis. The billing crisis is not, is not impossible to solve. The, the DA has done it in Cape Town. They did it after they won the 2006 elections. And you, you don't hear anything about a billing crisis now for the residents in Cape Town. What the billing crisis has been to the residents of the city of Johannesburg has been that for many years people would be receiving bills, they'd be receiving their rates and their lights and their water. And all of a sudden, in the last six to nine months, a very significant portion of the people who receive bills have been receiving bills that have absolutely no, no, no basis in reality. So people who might have been paying 800 rand a month for water, all of a sudden receive bills for 50 or 100,000 rand. And the problem with that is that uh, people then tend to stop paying altogether. And that has been one of the reasons why the revenue of Johannesburg has fallen. So what's happened in the city of Joburg is that over the last 10 years, we've accrued a debt of over 12 billion rands which means that's money that's out there, that's people who owe the city money and, and if that money is not in, essentially it means that the city cannot be able to pay its own expenses. And that's why there's this extreme pressure on the city that they're going out to cut off residents illegally, forcing people to pay, doing illegal things such as cutting people's water, not giving them enough notice, simply that they want the cash in the bank so that they can meet their obligations. The city of Johannesburg has outstanding debt of about 14 billion rand, so they've got, they've got 14 billion rand borrowed. That helps them to provide capital to do a number of the projects that they do. But the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is the fact that there's a 1.3 billion rand hole in connections at the moment. So, so the city's either got to fund that, or it's actually got to cut back on its services. And there's a limit to how much the city can actually borrow. So at a point, um, where we are at the moment is that the city is actually cutting back on its services to, to its residents to make up for the shortfall. The problem is we're already paying about one, one and a half billion rand a year in, uh, in interest payments on our debt. That's a very significant amount of money. What we do know is that we've been told that there's a book of about 13 billion rand of outstanding debtors, of people that owe money to the city. People, you know, people who haven't paid, paid their bills and that's businesses and private individuals as well. I think the problem has been over the last year is that we've had the local government elections and the ANC in all honesty hasn't really had the political will to actually go out and go and collect that money because it means collecting it from a lot of their, their own residents and also from, from government as well. You know, there's a famous story of when Helen Zilla took over the city of Cape Town and there was a large outstanding book of, uh, of debtors owing to the city as well. And one of those very large outstanding debtors was actually the airports company of South Africa. And Helen Zilla went out to Cape Town Airport and told airports company that unless they paid the money the lights would be turned off and the airports company of South Africa paid up very quickly and was one of the, that was one of the issues that helped to get the Cape Town debt down. One of the reasons that the 12 billion came through was because last year we went ahead and built Soccer City. Great invention for Joburg but actually we didn't have the cash for it 
And so some of it has to come from National Treasury, some of it has to come from you as a resident, but the city is incapable of collecting from both ends, National Treasury and the residents, and therefore we have an accumulation of an amount that we really don't have the money for. But Cape Town also built a stadium. How did Cape Town land up not being in debt like Joburg? What did, what did Cape Town do differently? Cape Town has done two very significant things. The first thing is that uh, Helen Zilla, who was then the mayor of Cape Town, took a stance with the provincial and national governments to say to them, wait, hang on, we are not putting a single brick on that stadium until the infrastructure grant, which a stadium is a huge infrastructure in the city, has been given from National Treasury. And people went up in arms and said she was being unfair, she was holding the World Cup hostage. But the fact of the matter is that the residents of Cape Town didn't have to fit the bill for a stadium that was benefiting a national project. And so National Treasury then had to fit the bill. In Johannesburg, we compromised our position on that and said, we'll build if you pay us back. Well, National Treasury hasn't done that and that creates a problem. The second issue is that Cape Town have got a very efficient billing program. It's the same one we use in Joburg, except the implementation in Cape Town is much quicker. Meaning that if you've got a query, it gets resolved in under seven days, etc., etc. There are mechanisms that they've put in place to ensure that the money they put out a bill, they collect the same amount of money. And Helen Zilla took a very strong stance to do what has become known as a pink ticket campaign, where she went all around the neighborhoods and collected what was due to the city. Those who can pay should pay, and those who can't pay, there needs to be systems that cater for that. And then the other issue is that actually 40% of the bills in Johannesburg come from business, the other lot are from government, and then the household expenditure is actually a smaller proportion of that. Which means that there are businesses out there who are refusing to pay the city. Whether it's because the city cannot build them correctly or not, the realities are people, the city is not able to collect that money. What's even more shocking for me is that there are government departments that use buildings within the city that refuse to pay those amounts. Or, or have delayed on paying their accounts. And because it's the same government, we tend to delay on that. And one of the situations that we're in at the moment has been that there's been a major uh, strategy of cut-offs from, from people in the city. A lot of residents all over Johannesburg in the last few days have had their electricity cut off, have had their water cut off. And uh, particularly on Friday afternoons, it's created a lot of hardship for people who will then be without water or electricity. The problem is you can only really do that if you've actually got a system that can sort queries out immediately. So if people's water and electricity get cut off, you can't take days to sort those queries out from people. You need to be able to keep people reconnected. And in a sense, if you've actually got a system that can't sort out the problems and you then force people to pay extortionate amounts of money, it really is extortion on the residents of the city of Johannesburg. And that's what worries us in the DA, is that a lot of people who can't afford large amounts of cash uh, are being asked to pay unreasonable amounts of money to have their water and lights reconnected city has been disconnecting people who have been making regular payments and still have legitimate queries. As soon as I received that information, I escalated through to the uh, query resolution team or the disconnection and reconnection team and they verify that the detail is correct and they issue a reconnection order. Unfortunately, it can take up to 72 hours for these um, services to be restored. Second to that, uh, we also have people that are due to financial problems in dire financial distress and have become def default payers. What they need to do is they need to go to a walk-in centre jotted all over the city of Joburg and the main one being the Bramfontein uh, Tuso House walk-in centre to go and sign an acknowledgement of debt where they declare that they do owe the amount outstanding to the city and set up a payment plan according to their financial needs and what they can afford to pay the city back. Once that acknowledgement of debt has been signed, if it is sent to me with all the relevant details such as account number, physical address, I can get the disconnection order, um, the pre-disconnection order that's been issued can be removed or if your services has been, have been disconnected, I can make sure that it is restored to you once again. The DA supports any legal credit control measures to make sure that their debts, um, that the city is entitled to recoup its debts. However, the DA objects to the fact that people are not being issued a two-week notice, which is a constitutional court ruling, as well as the fact that some residents are having their water services disconnected. And this is a basic human rights violation where residents are allowed access to water, and I think there's a ruling of about six kiloliters a month, Residents are entitled to water and the city is not allowed to tamper with those services. I would urge residents that are victims of disconnection to not take the law in their own hands and go and remove any seals or valves or open any connections that have been closed by the city. 
um, this is city property, or though it might be on your own private property, it, is still, um, it still belongs to the city, and you could face criminal charges from the city if you go and tamper with whatever measure they have taken against you. Irrespective if they have been right or wrong, you will come out as a criminal in the story. Certainly what we would do as the DA is we would call upon the officials in the city of Johannesburg not to keep, cut people off over Christmas and New Year, to effectively put a moratorium of cutoffs between the 16th of December and the, and the 4th of January. Because a lot of the residents in the city do go away on holiday over that period, um, be it back to their, their, their homes, and be it down to the beach. What happened last year was that the city did a, a whole series of cutoffs in, in December and January. A lot of people came home and found that they had no electricity in their home for two weeks and had fridges full of bad food and just, just, general, uh, just general unhappiness really. Uh, and really just as a, as a sign of humanity, we just said to the city, actually desist from your cutoffs over Christmas and New Year because normally a lot of the people in the call centres are away on, on holiday as well so it's that, that much more difficult to get your problems resolved and we're just concerned that we're going to see a repeat of that again this year. In the city of Johannesburg we've done a number of things. The first one is we've allocated a number of councillors over and above their ward duties, over and above what they do to really give a focus to the issue of billing and we've got some great champions because in essence Politicians give oversight to the city's administration and so when you get th three or four people who really are putting an enormous amount of pressure on the relevant parties, starting from the city manager, starting when going to the MMC for finance and then ultimately the executive director who is responsible for billing, those ward councillors are giving, ward and PR councillors are putting enough pressure on it. So as a resident you need to know that we're forcing this issue. So Councillor David Potter, I'm handling all the escalated councillor billing queries that come through via all the DA councillors within our caucus. Loading them onto a spreadsheet and escalating them via different channels within the city, revenue and customer relationship department for resolution. I'm liaising directly with city officials in the different departments including the VIP customer relationship and key accounts department who has been allocated to councillors to resolve billing queries. The process within the VIP department is very slow. They are severely understaffed with only three officials handling councillor queries. At this point today, mid-November, I have escalated at least 150 queries to them since the 17th of July. I've received my first report back and 35 queries were resolved of which 12 queries I've had to send back. These queries relate directly to billing of water, electricity, and it's a serious concern that the queries are not being resolved quick enough, and that by the time the query is logged and it's resolved, there's a huge time lapse and, and time that's wasted in getting that query resolved. Other queries that are resolved quite quickly is rates queries, and I thank that department for resolving those queries um, with speed, but there is greater concern about the whole billing system. There's certain departments which resolve queries better than other departments. The biggest concern is electricity and water meter readings that take a long time to resolve and the city officials and management of the Revenue and Customer Relationship Department need to put energy and resources into these departments to get these queries resolved quickly. One of the officials commented to me that uh, billing queries are taking two weeks on average to resolve um, if you look at the spreadsheet that I have that is clearly not happening at this stage. The list in, was given to the MMC for finance on the 27th or so of September. That is the list that I have referred to of which the 35 queries were resolved of which I had to send 11 or 12 back to the department because those residents who escalated their queries to me said that their queries are still not resolved. That is a concern. We are working many hours a day doing the administration's job. We as councillors have been told we should not be doing administration duties of the city, but if your residents have been disconnected, you pretty much have no choice but to help them and get them reconnected. Councillor Linus Muller has done a great job in getting residents reconnected. Obviously we need to be mindful and assist those residents that are not hiding behind the billing crisis and not paying their account but that have genuine queries and a lot of the disconnections that we've received are residents that have had genuine queries that continue to pay regularly but that were cut off. Further to that, um, the types of people that were cut off were those residents that had uh, prepaid meters installed, their conventional meter was removed and the city has failed to update their 
um, account to reflect that the prepaid meter is now on their property and continue to build estimates on their account. Change of ownership is another big problem within the city. Change of ownership is now done once your account is, uh, once your house has been transferred to your name. You can't go to the walk-in center and change the previous owner's meters into your name until rates department has created an account number. This process takes up to six months. There's some residents that I'm dealing with now who haven't had their account opened by rates and taxes department for over a year, which has created chaos. And those residents were subject to termination and disconnection, even though they had tried their utmost best to get their account opened by the city. There is success, but it's very limited and slow and frustrating at times. We do need the cooperation of the VIP customer relationship department who has been tasked to handle VIP queries via councillors and we really need their support. First of all, some of the um, queries are so complex that they actually need to go and speak to a resolver of a complaint. And secondly, a certain ceiling has been reached with the VIP unit as well, where they're not um, responding to queries and complaints escalated to them. I then encourage residents to rather go to the walk-in centre for face-to-face -face interaction with, a, with an agent. It's a Tuso house, it's number 61 Jorison Street in Bromfontein. Always when you look at any, any, any system, if it's not working, there's, there's something wrong and you've got, to, you've got to ascertain what is wrong. And nine times out of ten it boils down to management. That management is not, you know, not managing the process properly. And we found out that the, the head of that uh, billing department uh, has not qualified on the, the SAP system. Um, now, every single individual there needs to be qualified on the SAP system to be able to assist people with their billing because the SAP system is, is what is running the whole billing system. Now, you've got a guy right at the top who hasn't qualified. He failed his exam and he failed to rewrite the exam. And now, he's this the guy is, managing. And he's the manager. Now, now this, this you, can, you can understand, has a major underlying effect on, on the staff and the fact that things are not happening the way they should be doing. So what, what are we going to be doing on the 26th is to highlight this to the public because I'm, I'm always a believer that if we don't get together as a community and put pressure on local government to do the things that need to be done to make a system work, then who is going to? The, the residents out there think that's our responsibility as councillors, but as you can see, Khatan are just two people, and for us to make it work, it has to be a whole lot more than two people. The system has failed, and we know that we can fix it. We say you must devolve it. Take it away from being run at a central point at uh, Tusa House, and devolve it into regional areas, and then capacitize those regional areas properly. So when you sit down with a call center operator, uh, that you are able to sort your problem out there and there. It's not just something that gets logged and gets put into a system that you have no real trace. People want to be handling with individuals and be able to, to know that, you know what I mean, this is somebody that cares about my problem and this is somebody that's going to sort out my problem. Now I'm adamant that if we do not get the support of the greater public out there, 26th of, of, of November, that's Saturday, 11 o'clock in front of the Report Civic Centre, that's 100 Christian on Devet Street. If we do not get that support, then management again and the politicians are going to believe it's it's not, not as serious as we're making it out to be. And this is what I've always said, it's the apathy of our communities that are making things not to work. We really got to get up and stand together and say enough is enough and we expect as many people as possible there on the, on the 11th. On the 26th at 11 o'clock. Thanks. We had our finance committee breakaway this last week, and uh, all of us in the DA committee are actually very really excited by what was told to us by the city officials and by the uh, by the ANT MMT of, of the city of Johannesburg, because it does appear that they've uh, they've accepted the the problems that, that are in the city. They understand that customer service has been very bad, and part of the mission statement of the city of Johannesburg is that it is a customer centric city. And that certainly hasn't been what customers have experienced. We find customers going into the walk-in centres of the city and waiting hours to get queries resolved. And that's certainly not the way that people in Johannesburg should be dealt with. So there does appear now to be a, an understanding of this by the, uh, by the ANC politicians and the, and the officials in the city of Johannesburg. They understand that this building crisis now needs to be brought to a very quick resolution. Now, as DA councillors, we're only too happy to assist wherever we can to give uh, to give guidance and to give information as to where we've been successful to try and sort these problems out. Um, 
And certainly we're very excited. What we're going to be doing uh, in our committee is holding the, uh, the ANC officials to account. So we, a lot of promises have been made, a lot of very exciting things have been told to us in the last week. And if they can just implement half of what they've told us they will do, then you can be assured that things in the city of Johannesburg will change quite significantly on the finance side. We've been promised that by January next year, uh, which is only six weeks away, that this matter will be sorted out and that uh, emails will be responded to and that the email box will no longer be full. If city officials follow through on what they've promised, what we will see is, uh, is a decrease in waiting times, we'll see an improvement in the quality of bills that are going out, uh, we'll see a general uh, increase uh, in the city's ability to be able to resolve queries uh, quicker, and hopefully far more accurate bills going out as well. So what, we, what we've been told is that by the end of this financial year, which will be June next year, uh, that the billing crisis really should be a thing of the past. That, uh, you know, because really the reason why we're here is that we're here to serve the residents of Johannesburg. And we really and truly want to see this billing crisis get, get, get better because there are a whole lot of other things that we would like to do in the city of Johannesburg. And to be honest with you, to be stuck with just resolving queries for people keeps us away from a whole lot of other things that we could, that we could be doing. And I want to encourage residents to keep the dialogue with the city alive. Keep making sure that this city is held accountable for your bills not being correct, for you are the ones who make sure the city stays afloat.